In the past few episodes of History Traveler and American Artifact, we've been in southern Germany at Hitler's Berghof on the Obersalzberg. This is the mountain retreat where Hitler spent a large part of his time and where he made many of his most consequential decisions. It's also where many important meetings took place. In those episodes, we showed the ruins of the Berghof, along with archival footage shot by his mistress, Eva Braun. This footage that she shot on a 16mm camera was seized by the U.S. Army in Germany in 1945. From the 28 original camera rolls that were discovered, the U.S. Army assembled them into 8 reels. The footage that she shot has been used in many documentaries on World War II. But who are the people in these films? And what does this footage tell us about the Berghof? These are questions that have largely been overlooked. So we thought that we would set aside some time to do something different for this channel and offer up an analysis of the sections of film from Hitler's home movies that were shot at or near the Berghof. The footage that we are looking at right now was shot on the east side of the Berghof where people would primarily enter and exit. And uh, in this group are Hertha and Erwin Schneider and also the Brauns. Hertha Schneider was Ava Braun's best friend. We're going to see their two daughters right here. Uh, this is Ursula and Bridget. But while her husband was away on military duties, she spent a lot of time at the Berghof. This is obviously uh, different people greeting Hitler, but we get a rare look inside of the Berghof. Uh, and I want to take a moment to focus on this guy right here. This is Otto Gunsche. He is Hitler's personal bodyguard. And not to ruin the end, but on the 30th of April 1945, Hitler and Eva Braun are going to commit suicide in the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin as the Soviet army is closing in. Well, it was Otto who was tasked with cremating the bodies after the suicide. He stood outside the door as the act was taking place and then announced their deaths and then carried out the cremation. But right here in the Berghof at this moment, he had no idea what was ahead of him. Now, as we move on to the next clip, the three guys that we're looking at here are Adolf Wagner, Heinrich Hoffmann, and Martin Bormann. Uh, Wagner was the Gauleiter of Munich, and here we see Hitler and his personal photographer, uh, Heinrich Hoffmann. Many of the famous photos of Hitler that you see were, were taken by Heinrich Hoffmann. Uh, here he is again. And in this next clip, there in the background, the guy in the glasses, that is Dr. Theo Morell, who was Hitler's personal physician. It's thought that this footage was shot on New Year's Eve of 1939. And in this clip right here, you can see Hitler and Eva Braun talking with their guest. And in the background, there's a very large tapestry. Well, this is a Gobelin tapestry. Uh, this is a French manufacturer that had been making tapestries for the French royal family ever since Louis XIV. And Hitler was quite fond of them and uh, wanted to have one right there at the Berghof. Now, as we transition to the color footage, I want to stop on this frame right here. This is most likely being shot from the second floor of the Berghof from Eva Braun's bedroom. We're facing east. The house that you see up on the hill is Martin Bormann's house. He was the uh, secretary for Hitler. And in the foreground, we see the east wing of the Berghof. So on the lower levels, that would be the kitchen uh, and then a little bit closer to us, the dining room. Jumping now to the west side of the Berghof, this is the main terrace. Now we're going to be seeing a lot of footage from this spot right here. Uh, this is the, the view that you would have from the main terrace. And if we go back inside to the, the main living room, well, what we are looking at here is the great window. So this was about 9 meters wide and about 3.5, 3.6 meters tall. It had 90 panes of glass that could retract down into the floor so that from the inside, you would have an open air view to the north of this scene right here. So what we are looking at is the Untersberg. Uh, just on the other side would be Hitler's homeland of Austria. We've now jumped back to the east side of the Berghof on the terrace. And uh, you can see this Nazi banner here. So dignitaries and guests, well, this is the first thing that they would see when visiting Hitler. 
We're now looking at the Berghof from a slightly different vantage point. This is from the north looking back to the south from a place called Muslarkopf Hill. This is where Hitler's tea house was. Now after the expansion of the House Wachenfeld to the Berghof in 1936, Martin Bormann commissioned the architect Roderick Fick to construct a tea house on Muslarkopf, uh, which was about a 20 minute walk from the Berghof. You can see it's overlooking the Berchtesgaden Basin, has quite the view, and people make much of the eagle's nest, but this was actually Hitler's favorite spot. So he would bring people down here on walks, they would relax, they would have tea in this cylindrical building that was built into the hillside, and uh, Hitler would even sometimes, you know, take a nap and would then be driven back up to the Berghof, but everybody else had to walk. Here again is Adolf Wagner. Notice the limp that he has. Well, that's because he lost a leg in World War I and had a wooden leg. Shifting now to some footage of Eva Braun and her friends sunbathing and just generally goofing around on the terrace of the Berghof. So here's Eva Braun. Uh, next to her is film actress Elsa von Mollendorf, who was a very popular German film actress at the time. And next to her in blue is Gerda Bormann, who was the wife of Martin Bormann. And the woman that you just saw in pink was Eva Braun's friend, Herda Schneider. So Gerda Bormann is kind of an interesting character. And uh, while Elsa von Mollendorf is uh, posing and hamming it up for the camera, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about Gerda. Uh, this is a woman who dedicated her life to kind of living up to this ideal of German motherhood. In a 13-year period, she had 10 kids, which qualified her for the Mother's Cross in Gold, which was awarded to women who had eight or more children for the German Reich. And uh, when we shift back here, there's a, another woman who is present. You can see her in white. Uh, that is Gretel Braun. So I'm assuming that she was the one operating the camera at first. Here you can see her and Hertha Schneider taking pictures. Uh, looks like we might have some of the, the Bormann children who are also here at the terrace. Okay, so here you, again you can see them taking pictures. And then Ava Braun uh, going through some spices or some herbs or, or something like that. Uh, something kind of interesting about Ava Braun. Uh, of course, I've already mentioned that she was Hitler's mistress. Uh, what I didn't mention is that when they met, Hitler was 40 years old and Eva Braun was only 17. So here you can see Eva Braun going out onto the terrace with uh, one of her Scottish Terriers. I think that this one was named Ushi. And again, here's another view of the Berghof from the north, uh, looking to the south. You can see Hitler's office area there on the second floor. Here's Hitler on the main terrace. Again, this is also looking south. And we're going to be seeing a, a different figure here in just a second. Here he is right here standing next to Hitler. This is Julius Schaub. Now, he was part of the Beer Hall Putsch with Hitler. He actually served time in prison with Hitler and uh, later became SS member number seven. As time went on, he became a personal aide to Hitler and took care of day-to-day -day operations and travel plans and things like that. On April 22nd of 1945, Hitler admitted that the, the war was basically over and ordered Schaub to burn all of the documents in his safe there in the Fuhrer bunker and then ordered him to go down to Munich and burn all documents down there as well. The man that you see in the background is Albert Speer. This is a very recognizable face because he was part of Hitler's inner circle and he really shows up a lot. The man who is entering the frame right now is Gerhard Engel. He was the army adjutant to Hitler. Engel was the recipient of the Knight's Cross with Oak Leaves and in 1943 he gets transferred to the Western Front where he is going to command divisions in Aachen, Hürtgen Forest, and also in the Battle of the Bulge. Now, back to Albert Speer. Uh, Albert Speer was an architect who had designed the Reich's Chancellery and also the Nazi Party rally ground in Nuremberg. In February of 1942, after the death of Fritz Todt in a plane crash, well, Albert Speer was appointed the Reich's Minister of Armaments and War Production. Here, we're back on the terrace of the Berghof, and you can see Hitler with Albert Speer's kids. Speer is going to be arrested after the war, 
And one of the things that is going to draw some heat on Speer is that as the Reich's Minister of Armaments and War Production, uh, there was a lot of slave labor that was used in the Reich. Here we're introduced to a new figure in Ava Braun's home movies, and if you'll notice on the left arm, there's an armband that has a red, white, red color pattern. Well, that is for the Hitler Youth. The man that we are looking at right now is Balder von Schirach, who was the leader of the Hitler Youth. And then now we're back on the terrace. So it's something that I want to point out here, the, the main terrace actually set on top of the garage of the Berghof. This was in the first stage of reconstruction of the House Wachenfeld. So here you can see Hitler looking out over the Untersberg, looking towards his homeland in Austria. I think that this is Albert Speer right here. And uh, here for the first time we get introduced to Hitler's dog, Blondie. Here are a few more new faces. The man on the far right in the dark suit is Walter Huell. He was a uh, foreign office liaison, and he worked very closely with the man who is walking up from behind. That is Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Nazi Germany. We're now back over on the east side of the Berghof, and I believe this is being filmed from a guest room on the second floor of the East Wing. The three men that you see there on the steps are members of the SS Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. This was Hitler's personal bodyguard unit. Now, after the war, the Berghof is going to be completely wrecked. It would have been hit with bombs, it would have been burned by the SS, and the first men to reach the Berghof were members of the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division. And there's a really famous photo that was taken right here on the east side of the Berghof, right about where Hitler and these other two are standing. One of my big regrets from the trip that I took is that I didn't do a then and now shot while I was there. We're now back in the Berghof, and here we see some of the top leaders in the Third Reich. So in this shot right here, you can see Reinhard Heydrich, you can see Heinrich Himmler, you can see Martin Bormann right there up front. Here in this next shot, we're back to Joachim von Ribbentrop. Uh, he was, again, the foreign minister who had a key role in brokering the Pact of Steel with Italy and also the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with the Soviet Union, which carries his name. Uh, he is going to be the first one of the Nuremberg defendants to be executed by hanging at the end of the war. The room that they are in right now, I'm not exactly sure which one it is, uh, but I think that it is a small living room that was a part of the original House Wachenfeld. Reel number two is going to open up with a little bit different view on the west side of the Berghof. And again, we're looking to the north from this vantage point right here, looking towards Salzburg, Austria. Uh, now, in episode 67 of American Artifact, we talked about the Bormann tree. So you can go back and watch that episode to get the story on that tree at the end of the driveway. And then we're looking at this car pulling up, and who is it that is coming up the steps? Uh, well, it's none other than Hitler's pet monkey, Joseph Goebbels. So Goebbels was the minister of propaganda and uh, was also the president of something called the Chamber of Culture. So under his leadership, well, propaganda was being put into the press and into the radio and theater and films and literature and music. So culture flows downstream. So if you can put your message in upstream, well, it can go down to the people. And here we are again at the tea house, uh, or rather in front of the tea house at this overlook. Here's a, a quick shot of a guy that I think is Dr. Carl Brandt. Carl Brandt was an exceptionally terrible individual who was in charge of something called the T4 Euthanasia Program. And uh, after the war, he would be tried and convicted for his crimes and would be sentenced to execution by hanging. Here we have another quick view of the Berghof from the northeast side, and uh, that was from down below, obviously. And then we get a bunch of just little snapshots of the scenery around the Obersalzberg and in the area looking back now towards the Berghof from the north. So all of these little shots that we are seeing now kind of give us context as to what the Obersalzberg looked like during the era of the Third Reich. 
This is a clip that gets used pretty often in a lot of documentaries. The man that you see on the left who just looked back at the camera is Wilhelm Bruckner. He participated in the Beer Hall Putsch with Hitler, so wore the blood order on his uniform. Here we can see Hitler doing a little dance for some reason. Uh, Wilhelm Bruckner ended up becoming the chief adjutant for Hitler from 1934 to 1940 and later went on to serve in the German army and rose all the way to the rank of colonel. Back on the east side now, where some men who look to be on some official business have arrived at the Berghof. This next clip features some exceptionally evil men in the Third Reich. The man on the left is very recognizable. That is Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS and also the architect of the Holocaust. Next to him is Reinhard Heydrich, who many consider to be the most evil man in the Nazi regime, which is really saying something. Hitler called him the man with the iron heart. Others called him the butcherer of Prague. Now, Himmler would commit suicide at the end of the war. Heydrich was going to die in 1942 by assassins uh, in something called Operation Anthropoid. That man that you see on the right is Karl Wolf. He was... Uh, the chief of staff for Heinrich Himmler, and uh, also the SS liaison for Adolf Hitler. Here we see Hitler examining some photo through a magnifying glass. The man on his left is Julius Schaub, and the guy who is on his right might be Hermann Esser. You can see the SS honor guard here getting ready on the east side of the Berghof, getting everything cleaned up and, and spiffy. Got a pretty creative shot right here. Uh, here is Heinrich Hoffmann in some very formal attire. And then again, we can see the SS Honor Guard getting gloved up and ready for something that appears to be very important. And it is the arrival of Count Siano, who was the Italian foreign minister, who had come to the Berghof to have a meeting with uh, Hitler and some of the other high-ranking Nazis. We're moving now to a scene where there's some sort of dinner party going on at the Berghof, and there are a lot of people here, so I'm just going to point out a few. The man that you see on the left in the tan jacket, that is Max Wuncha. Now, he was originally part of the SS bodyguard unit, but went on to fight on the Eastern Front, was at the Battle of Kharkiv, and he would end up commanding the 12th SS Panzer Regiment of the 12th SS Panzer Division. We actually go to his grave in one of the episodes of History Traveler. Now, as I've been talking, we've moved to this table with Ribbentrop stirring his drink, and on the far right is a guy by the name of Jacob Verlin. Now, Verlin was an auto salesman and had connections at the Dahmer Benz Company, and it was through him that Hitler was working to build the Volkswagen. In this next scene, we see Hitler and his entourage descending down the steps on the east side of the Berghof. And if you look at the top of the screen, we get a little glimpse at the Zoom Turken. And then now we are back at the tea house, which, as I mentioned before, was Hitler's favorite spot in, in the Ober Salzburg. And uh, we're getting ready to see, yeah, here's another look inside of the, the tea house. So here we have Hitler sitting down and encouraging Ribbentrop to have a seat next to him. Looks like now we've moved to a different time of year where the weather has cooled off. The snow is seen in some different parts around the Berghof here and also up on the mountains. And as I'm watching these old films, I'm always wondering, you know, what was it that that these people were talking about. Now something that I want to mention here, because we have a really good look at the terrace, which is on top of the garage, when I was looking at the ruins of the Berghof, I had some people commenting on something that I said about the window, the, the great window, retracting down into the floor. They said that it went down into the garage. But as you can see from these clips here, that clearly cannot be the case. Now as we are looking here, uh, again, here is Hitler's doctor, and in the background is Hermann Esser. So this is definitely him. I think we had a glimpse of him before. And then we can also see uh, their wives and also uh, Eva Braun's sister sitting here on the terrace. 
we now have Ava Braun entering back into the film and as you can see she's kind of motioning and directing the person who is operating the camera. Ava Braun had worked in the studio of Heinrich Hoffman so she knew her way around a camera. As a matter of fact that's how she actually met Adolf Hitler was through her work with Heinrich Hoffman and as you can see she likes to be in front of the camera but having a, an eye would also want to make sure things were done right. Now the person we just saw who entered into the film who she has her arm around is Franz Schwartz who was the national treasurer of the Nazi party. Uh, he had joined the Nazi party in 1922 and had participated in the Beer Hall Putsch. As a matter of fact it was Schwartz who helped to raise money for the publication of Adolf Hitler's book Mein Kampf. And as uh, we continue on with the film and as Ava Braun is kind of doing her thing, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Schwartz. So in 1944, things were getting pretty rough for the, uh, for the Germans with the Allied bombings. And uh, Schwartz ended up receiving a War Merit Cross, first class with swords, for helping out during a bombing raid in Munich in April of 1944. And then at the end of the war, he would lead a Volkssturm battalion. He would end up being captured by the Allies and died in an Allied internment camp near Regensburg due to some recurring gastric troubles. Uh, he was 72 years old. Now earlier we saw kind of a dark clip of Hitler's dog, but now we get a little bit clearer view. This is his German Shepherd Blondie. Poor Blondie is not going to make it to the end of the war when Hitler and Eva Braun decided to commit suicide in the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin. Well, the cyanide capsule was first tested out on the dog to make sure that it was potent enough. Here we get a quick look at Hitler in the Wintergarten, which was a room in the original house. And then we jump over to the great room to get a look at the window that we've talked about a couple of times already that could retract down into the floor and gave this magnificent view to the north into uh, his home country of Austria. In this next clip, Walter Huell is going to come back into the picture, and with him is Gretel Braun, who was Ava Braun's sister. Now, Walter Huell was with Hitler in the very beginning at the Beer Hall Putsch, and he would be with him at the very end in the Fuhrer bunker in 1945. Uh, Walter Huell was one of the men who attended the wedding of uh, Ava Braun and Adolf Hitler, and he was also one of the men who wished them farewell right before they went and committed suicide together. And then here again we have Adolf Wagner. He's always very easy to pick out in these old films because of the, the big scar on his left cheek. I'm not sure if that was from the war or not, but I'm assuming that it is. Now we're back inside the Berghof where Hitler is greeting some of the women on staff there and you can see the big tapestry in the background so we can kind of get a little bit different view of the interior. Uh, that tapestry could actually be moved to the side and they would project movies up there on the wall. But uh, again you take all of these pieces of footage and you put them together and uh, each individual piece helps you to get a larger picture of what things looked like. And then we move into what is obviously a winter scene here on the Obersalzberg with really just some incredible views uh, to, to the north here. Here you can see a little birdhouse that they have set up and are feeding some of the wildlife. And then back on the terrace with Hitler and and Blondie. From this angle right here we can get a, a little bit better view of the western side of the Berghof where some of the staff would be quartered than anything that we've seen so far. And yeah it looks like they uh, got a, a pretty good snow there at uh, the Berghof that year. And in this clip we see Hitler meeting with uh, Martin Bormann. We're back inside of the Great Room and we really get a good look here 
at uh, just the, the space and also the fireplace in the back of the room. So those were the clips shot at the Berghof that were pulled from the first two reels of the Eva Braun films. We'll continue looking at some of the other footage pulled from other reels in future videos. One quick note, if there are any corrections that we need to make in the future, those corrections will be noted in the description. If you would like to see the episodes of History Traveler, an American artifact that we've shot here in southern Germany, then click on the link at the top. And if you would like to see the video that YouTube thinks that you would like to watch next, well, click on the link at the bottom.